Oh, it's painful. It's actually painful to look at. What was he thinking when he wrote this? I mean, it's just been a tirade over the last couple of days. But this might be one of the worst ones yet. I hate to see it. It does, in fact, grieve me that this kind of rhetoric is being slung around at such a time as this, you know, when, um, I don't know, our republic is crumbling and uh, Christians need one another now more than ever to throw a wrench into, um, into this discussion like this, like this, I think is like a, a terribly unwise move politically for Grace Bible Theological Seminary, um, and in terms of the charity and unity of the brethren at such a time as this. I'm not saying we shouldn't debate this right now. I don't think we should put debates on the uh, back burner, so to speak, especially ones as important as this one. But to approach the debate like this, I think, is extremely unfortunate. So, because he's approaching the debate like this, I'm going to respond in kind. Um, and I'm going to start by saying, this is foolish. It's embarrassing at an academic level. And to any lay person who's even semi-well-read on the primary source material when it comes to this issue here, it's very em embarrassing for Dr. Strayan and Dr. Johnson. I can only hope that Dr. Johnson's book... The Failure of Natural Theology, has better verbiage in it than this. If you think highbrow Thomism, sourced in large part from analytic theology, Aristotle, and pseudo-Dionysius, is going to preach in countless Baptist churches driven by love for the sufficiency of the Scripture, I have a summer retreat in Siberia to sell you at low, low price. This is incredible to me. And this this actually comes after a tweet that, that insults... Uh, you know, his fellow uh, Baptist brothers who hold to a, a Thomistic, you know, approach to natural theology and such, um, where he's, he's, he's pretty much just saying that if you're a Thomist, you're not a Protestant. If you're a Thomist, you're not a Reformed person. And here it seems to, you know, imply if you're a Thomist, you're not a Baptist, and you better watch out because if you preach this stuff or teach on it, you're going to be ran out of Baptist uh, of Baptist churches on a rail. Which, you know, is probably true, but that's a poor commentary, really, on the intellectual state of Christianity at large. Not so much uh, an indication of the truth of natural theology. But because it's just been uh, the last couple of days have just been full of high-handed, arrogant tweets and Facebook posts uh, by. Uh, a one Dr. Owen Strayan. What I'm going to do here, in addition to the three installments on my YouTube channel that I've already posted, I, I posted one about Thomas Aquinas, John Owen, and Stephen Charnock. Uh, then I posted a part one and part two, a mini series on the confessional literature uh, that shows that there was an accepted natural theology as a tenet of reformed, independent, and uh, particular Baptistic orthodoxy. Here, what I want to do is I want to look at uh, one of the earlier reformers, Franciscus Junius, on natural theology. I want to look at Herman Witsius. I want to look at Peter Van Maastricht, and I want to look, look at Jonathan Edwards. Um, Owen uh, made another interesting claim on his on his Facebook page. Uh, I believe it was yesterday, uh, and of course, it was shared by. Um, it was shared by Jeff Johnson, um, and uh, it says something along... Oh, there's a bunch of new goodies on this page, uh, on his Facebook page now. Anyway, yesterday at 9.42 a.m., he says, The Reformers, Puritans, Edwardsians, and Baptists all rejected the syncretistic philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. He doesn't specify what they rejected, he sounds like he's just saying or making the claim that they rejected his philosophy wholesale, which is demonstrably not the case. It's quite easy to to prove that that's just simply not the case. And even where you do have denouncements and disagreements with Aquinas and the Reformed and post-Reformed uh, literature, uh, you have other areas that uh, his language, categories, method are affirmed by virtue of their very their, their use of it. 
and employment of it in a positive way and, and not by way of rebuke or, or rejection. So what I want to do today is, you know, he makes this bold claim, the Reformers, Puritans, Edwardsians, and Baptists all rejected the syncretistic philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. If And he, he says that within the context of, of promoting the failure of natural theology, which is a book by Jeff Johnson, uh, whom many of us are anxiously awaiting. Can't wait to see what's in it. It looks like that there's going to be a critique of immutability in there, which uh, doesn't look like uh, it's going to start with any, you know, it's it's going to be off to a, a great start when you consider orthodoxy. Um, because a, a, a uh, an affirmation of change in God and a denial of immutability along those lines is heterodox. It's not orthodoxy. It's heresy to deny, uh, to do not, to deny um, the immutability of God or the unchangeableness of God. And it looks like that might come under fire in like chapter 7, I think, of this new book. But we'll have to wait and see. I don't want to make any premature uh, accusations at this point. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, I want to, again, I want to look at, beginning with Franciscus Junius. The language concerning natural theology that is found in Aquinas, much of it, I'm not saying all of it, nobody's arguing that, much of it is lifted from the Summa and appropriated to within the definition um, and the parts of theology in the Reformers and the Post-Reformed. And one example that we have of that, one very clear example that we have of that, is Franciscus Junius. If you read his book or you get his book on a treatise on true theology, Reformation Heritage Books has has published that, RHB, um, pick that up. It's not very long. Uh, the ordering, the methodology is not perfect. Obviously, uh, natural theology is is placed after a theology of union in Christ, but uh, it's in there. He has much to say about natural theology. He places it correctly. Um, he gives what would be a run of the mill orthodox understanding or explanation of what natural theology is. Orthodox. What I what I mean by orthodox, I mean Protestant orthodox, Reformed orthodox. Uh, and this is an opinion or a, a, an understanding of natural theology that would also be appropriated into the literature of the particular Baptists of the 17th century. Um, but let's look at this uh, from Fan Franciscus Junius. Now, there are a few different places that we go with him, and it's, it's kind of throughout his chapter on natural theology. What he's doing is he's proving certain theses. I think that there are 39 theses that he's venturing to prove. Um, I could actually just double check that real quick. Is it 39? Uh, 39 theses. And natural theology is a chapter in the de demonstration of these theses. And there are uh, a few theses, I guess four of them probably, uh, maybe five of them in the chapter on natural theology. So if you have that volume, this is all taking place uh, beginning on page 145. Uh, and I'm talking about the volume recently published, relatively recently printed by RHB, Reformation Heritage Books. And Junius says, Natural theology is that which proceeds from principles that are known in relation to itself by the natural light of the human understanding in proportion to the method of human reason. Now, there is no disagreement between that statement right there and how Thomas rudimentarily understands a natural theology. Um, and then on page 147, that's, so that's one thesis. I believe that's the first thesis on natural theology. The second thesis that he, that he makes and then subsequently supports is that the conception of this natural theology in the human understanding deals with things that are common and it is both veiled and imperfect. So this natural theology is by no means sufficient. That's even found in Thomas. Um, and he says, all the more then is there need for it to derive its perfection from supernatural theology. And if you take Thomas's question one and question two in volume one of the Summa Theologiae, uh, you get the same understanding. It's just summarized here uh, in, in, uh, in, in very basic form in Junius. Uh, so there's no evidence that there's any serious departure in terms of really just the formal statement of natural theology, a basic or rudimentary elementary understanding of natural theology. There's really no difference between this early 16th century reformer 
and and Thomas Aquinas on that point. Then he goes and he moves on to talk about the the natural theology uh, in Adam, and he says that from principles shared, veiled, and imperfect, it had to be nurtured natural theology or this natural knowledge of God in Adam before the fall. It had to be nurtured and caused to grow by reasoning and then perfected by grace. And then he says on page 154 on natural theology after the fall, after this nature, however, was corrupted, those first principles yet remained in individuals. So the the principles necessary for natural theology, they were still shared, veiled, and imperfect. So there's some continuity between uh, post-lapse and pre-lapse man. Uh, And here's the difference. He says, but now they were completely compromised in themselves and quite confused among themselves as as though as though mere broken fragments of our nature because of our depravity and it's because of our depravity that these things are broken and distorted and perverted okay it's not that the, the problem again that the problem is not with the concept of natural theology uh, and it's not because of some uh, imperfection and natural revelation, and it's not even because the natural revelation doesn't get in here and exist as a kind of natural theology. The problem is ethical, where we then venture to take that natural theology that we have acquired and pervert it into our own likeness rather than um, rather than uh, worshiping God through it. And so, according to Romans 1, we are condemned on that basis, or at least partially on, upon that basis. Moving now to Herman Witsius, uh, who was a Dutch Reformed Puritan. So we're moving from the Reformed era, the early Reformation, kind of middle Reformation, you might say, to Herman Witsius, who was post-Reformed. He was a Puritan. And he also understands there to be a natural theology. And in fact, his articulation of it comes within the context of offering proofs for the existence of God. Uh, and so in ver- in, in, in shares a lot of continuity with Aquinas for that reason. He says, besides innate knowledge of God, of which man has the principles in his own mind, there is another argument arising from the consideration of the various other creatures around him. The sacred writings instruct us in numberless passages that the existence of the supreme being, and before this, on the same page, and this is volume one on the Apostles' Creed, he he calls God the first mover or the first cause, rather. And so he's using, he's appropriating the language found in both Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas as he seconds Aristotle, um, and so finds some some at least uh, uh, superficial continuity with, with Aquinas. He says, The sacred writings instruct us in numberless passages that the existence of the supreme being may be inferred By incontrovertible arguments, that means these arguments necessarily follow to their conclusions based on the premises, from the contemplation of the creatures. So in other words, we look around and we infer, uh, and I would add that we can deduce, but he uses the term infer. We infer from creation the conclusion, therefore God exists. And this, these arguments that arise from that which we are surrounded by, namely the world that has been made by God, are incontrovertible. They cannot be refuted. They they follow necessarily from their premises. Okay, so that's Herman Witsius, and actually Witsius has much more to say on that, but for time's sake, I will I will move on to Peter van Maastricht, Petrus van Maastricht, who was another Dutch Reformed Puritan, um, and his first two volumes of his works are out. Again, Reformation Heritage Books publishes those, um, and he he explicitly and clearly and emphatically affirms a natural theology. Uh, This comes to us in volume one of his works, the Prolegomena. He says, Christian theology does not exclude natural theology of which we are taught its parts. So Christian revealed theology, he says, does not exclude natural theology, but includes it just as a larger quantity includes a smaller one. Therefore, just as revealed theology is summed up as those matters that must be believed and those that must be done, natural theology, which displays nothing but its bits and pe- but bits and pieces of revealed theology, so he's making a distinction, just like John Brown of Haddington does, between revealed theology and natural theology, or we might say natural religion and revealed religion in terms of the practice of this theology. 
uh, displays but bits and pieces of revealed theology. So again, it's an imperfect theology. It's not complete. It's not sufficient unto salvation or anything like that. Consists in things that must be known, which philosophers, referring to the Greeks, which philosophers embrace in their metaphysics and spiritual writings, and things that must be done, which they consider in their ethics, economics, and politics. Therefore, natural theology is partly in the intellect, he says, which recognizes a true or false theological point, either theoretically or practically. He makes this important qualifier, and I decided to include this in the description. He says, natural theology must be carefully distinguished from pagan theology as such, because the latter is false and the former is true. So there he says that there is a that natural theology is true, it's right, it's good. There is a pagan version of natural theology, a distortion of it that is false. In the Latin, he would call it theologia falsa, um, and should be rejected. All right, and um, I think Thomas makes that uh, clear as well. Uh, he um, certainly rejects Aristotle's uh, natural theology on several points, um, as well as uh, other of the philosophers both heathen and Muslim. So that's uh, Peter Van Maastricht. And again, he has much more to say. Uh, there are references to Aquinas in nearly all of these authors. Uh, Peter Van Maastricht's quite rough on Aquinas, but not where you would think he would be rough on Aquinas. It, 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 it seems to me that where the Reformed and the post-Reformed had the biggest issues with Aquinas would lie in his sacramentology, his doctrine of justification, and sanctification, them being conflated together, his his idea of merit and all of that. But there's another point at which the, especially the post-reform, departed from Thomas, and for which they chided him the most, as represented preeminently in, in Peter Van Maastricht's work, is in Thomas's relegation of theology to a speculative science, almost exclusively. Now, Thomas is odd on this on this question because he, he actually doesn't relegate all of theology to a speculative science exclusively. He just says it's mostly speculative. Van Maastricht takes issue with that and says that, you know, theology actually needs to be seen as predominantly practical. Um, but you and 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 I would actually agree with with Maastricht uh, to an, to one extent um, in that if it just remains, in the speculative realm or in the theoretical realm and never gets down into the uh, effective nature of, of man and his heart and his mind and his actions, his thoughts and his deeds, um, then there is real no use for that speculative theology on our part. That doesn't render speculative theology invalid. Uh, we, need to, we need to make that note. And Maastricht wouldn't say that Thomas's speculative theology is invalid on several points. However, to understand it as only speculative or even mostly speculative takes away the the wisdom or, or the artistic component of Christian theology, which I think is everywhere in Scripture. And, and Maastricht makes that correction wonderfully in his work, his systematic work, which is called Theoretical Practical Theology. That's his project, and he's, he's very good at that. So I would commend uh, Peter Van Maastricht to anyone wanting to have a... a uh, clarified understanding of where the Reformed Orthodox ended up. Because according to Richard Muller, Peter Van Maastricht, you're really looking at the, the creme de la creme of uh, post-Reformed theology. You're looking at the fullest expression or the most articulate expression of it in Peter Van Maastricht. Again, that's the words of uh, Richard Muller, uh, well, a summary, a paraphrase of Richard Muller in Volume 1, The Prolegomena of his post-reformed reform dogmatics. Now moving to Jonathan Edwards. There's been some confusion on Jonathan Edwards. Uh, some would say, again, this plays in relevantly to, uh, to this rejection of natural theology that's coming down the pipeline in Dr. Jeff Johnson's book and has been talked about uh, in Owen Strayan's posts. Um, there's going to be some criticism of at least a version or a... a particular articulation of, of God's immutability or unchangeableness in that book. Uh, if you look at the table of contents, this becomes quite apparent. Um, and there has been some confusion, some scholarly confusion, 
about where Jonathan Edwards stood on this matter. This is probably may be part of the reason why Dr. Strayan uh, threw the Edwardsians in with the group that he believes to be rejecting outrightly Thomas's thought, uh, seemingly in toto, um, is because of this confusion right here that we're about to look at. So uh, the, the issue here is immutability and simplicity, okay, which are two doctrines that are heavily developed in the thought of Christians kind of off the back of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas influenced classical theism in a way no one else had. So when you read in the Confessions, for example, God is without body parts or passions, a lot of that language is um, derivative ultimately from Holy Scripture and from natural revelation, but they are epistemologically and, and you know how we understand we develop our understanding of, of of what is true, right? We're not perfect. We don't have a perfect theology right off the get go. So Christians have have used Thomas to talk about these things, and and a lot of this language comes from him. I'm not saying the concepts that the language represents come from him. He didn't invent this stuff, but the language used to articulate it and explain it c comes from him. Um, and so, what's at stake here? looking at Edwards, is if Edwards did deny simplicity or divine immutability as classically understood, then you could certainly lump Edwards in with that group who rejected Thomas outrightly. Um, but I don't think that that's, that's possible. If you look at The Lord is One, Reclaiming Divine Simplicity, it's edited by Joseph Minnick, Ansi Camel. It's uh, put out by uh, Devonant Press or the Devonant Retrievals, the Devonant Institute. Um, what they do is they look at some of the, uh, the, the statements in question by Edwards, and then they look at other statements that he's made to throw some light on those statements. So one of the things that Edwards says, he says, if a man should tell me that the immutability of God is God, or that the omnipresence of God and authority of God is God, I should not be able to think of any rational meaning of what he said. It hardly sounds to me proper to say that God's being without change is God, or that God's being everywhere is God, or that God's having a right of government over creatures is God. Part of the problem here with Edward's language is, is the issue of predication and what kind of predication we assign to the divine essence. And I think this becomes abundantly clear when you look at later areas, and this is coming out of the works of Jonathan Edwards, you know, he says things like this, where he affirms a Thomistic understanding of classical theism. He says, from these things are collected this notion of the nature and attributes of God, that he is the first being from eternity. Again, you have this, this firstness alluded to. From eternity, unmade, incorruptible, infinite, incomprehensible, self-existent, necessarily existing, self-sufficient, invisible, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, a spirit or mind altogether incorporeal, a pure act. Actus puris is, uh, is, is heavily Thomistic. It is a classical theistic category. You cannot affirm actus puris and then reject classical theism or reject Thomism in toto. This is a distinctive of classical theism. A pure act whose essence is energy uh, or or active uh, or let's say we might say um, active potential, which just is power, whose essence is energy without all extension or bulk, indivisible, unmultipliable, one most simple. So there he affirms divine simplicity. Everywhere present, yet not properly in place, perfectly immutable. Okay, so Edwards affirms immutability. And he affirms it perfectly so, or absolutely so. God's whole external duration is a permanent successive duration without past, present, and future, or any successive flux. Look for the language when, when Johnson's book drops. Look for the language in there that attempts to make God mutable by relating him to his creation in some flawed way. This has happened with Dr. K. Scott Oliphant, with Dr. John Frame, it happened with the impassibility debate in Arbka, Bob Gonzalez and all of them denying impassibility. There is some desire to try and relate God to his creation in a way that makes God dependent in one way or another 
on his creation. It's called theistic personalism. Dr. James Dolezal called it theistic personalism. It's also called uh, theistic mutualism. And what Edwards is doing here is he's outrightly denying theistic personalism. There is no room for personalism in any way, shape, or form in Edwards's theology here. There's no successive flux. Frame, for example, affirms two existences in God, an existence, an existence outside of time and an existence inside of time. And by the way, this happens at creation. We're not talking about the incarnation here. Um, Dr. K. Scott Oliphant does uh, something similar with accidental properties accruing to God as a result of his uh, creatorhood. Um, Edwards dashes all of that to pieces. He says, there, it, God's unchangeable. There's no successive flux pervading and diffused through all things without local, mo without local motion or rest. So now he's, de he's denying in God any movement. God is intelligent, infinitely wise, yea, infinite intellect and wisdom itself. Excuse me. An omnipotent being who can do everything that doesn't involve a contradiction. That being who only truly has being. Uh, that is a monumental affirmation of classical theism. There's nothing more you need in Edwards really to, uh, to examine whether or not he believed in classical theism, but that statement right there. But you can you can find it throughout his work. It's not just it's not just here. So anyway, um, I think that natural theology. We looked at the confessions already in part one and two of the mini series. Uh, we're looking at individuals here and their theology. Natural theology emerged as a tenet of orthodoxy within the reformed and post reformed communities. This is not debatable. The only time it becomes debatable is in twentieth and post-20th century theological treatises by men like Cornelius Van Til, Gordon Clark, and others who drank the Kantian Kool-Aid. And like R.C. Sproul said, and it, and it rings true, you either choose Kant or you choose Thomas Aquinas in terms of epistemology and the distinction between epistemology and ontology. Very, very important distinctions to make here. And one of the things that's at stake in things in 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 this discussion in this debate is uh objectivity absolutely is there is there any way to have uh a true knowledge of what's out there is there any way to know objectively what nature is and its informational content and all of that or are we stuck in our own minds, so to speak, trapped with our own thoughts, unable, quite, to get out there and apprehend the real world. Um, and uh, Van Til and others would say yes. They would answer yes. They would attach some qualifications to the answer, but they would say you need divine revelation in order to know anything true about the world around you. Um, and <laughs> that is a Socinian tenet. Uh, it is a Socinian tenet. You can look at Francis Turretin. You can look at uh, Stephen Charnock and see that that is a Socinian distinctive. Socinians were not Orthodox. They were not Christians. Um, they were uh, heretics. Uh, they were heretics in terms of their theology proper. They were heretics in terms of Trinitarianism. They were heretics in terms of the doctrine of Christ, incarnation, deity of Christ, and so on. They were all m sorts of messed up. And look... This whole thing, this whole rejection of natural theology is not just a matter of rejecting Roman Catholicism, right? It, 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 that's, not, that's not all you end up accomplishing with this. And, and all, of the, all of the distortions and perversions of Roman Catholicism are being rejected, right? Are, and there's no question about what needs to be rejected from Rome. What you do by rejecting natural theology is you obliterate the ability for man to know the world objectively. And, um, and then what you do uh, subsequently from that is you obliterate a plain reading of Romans 1 and Romans 2 and man's responsibility for suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and all of that. And I will say this, I'll end, I'll end with this. This whole thing where Jeff Durbin and James White and, you know, Owen Strayan and, and 
Jeff Johnson and all these guys, Bob Gonzalez, you are playing with the doctrine of God. You're playing with the doctrine of God in playing and tinkering with natural theology. And when someone plays with the doctrine of God, uh, it is worth throwing down the gauntlet for. When one tinkers with the divine essence, when one tinkers with man's knowledge of the divine essence through that which has been made, and, and thus that reflects on the divine essence itself and who God is, um, this whole classical theism and natural theology, those, these things go together. Perhaps it would be worth me doing another episode just to show how they, how they relate. But this was a discussion absolutely worth throwing down the gauntlet. I just hope, I, I had hoped that we could do so in a cordial manner um, instead, of, instead of seeing these ridiculously embarrassing tweets and Facebook posts. And the embarrassment... I think, has been demonstrated in the fact that these bold, absolute, and seemingly universal claims have been proven false just by a cursory glance, that's all we've really done here, at the Reformers and the Post-Reformed and the confessional literature. So I, you know, I invite any of you who stand on that side uh, with Johnson and GBTS and and Strayan and all of them to answer this, to explain these uh, reformers and post-reformed who affirmed a natural theology and who shared a great deal of commonality with the angelic Dr. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. That's your invitation. Uh, leave comments under these videos. Uh, make your own videos, write responses to blog articles, to books, cite sources, deal with the, deal with the stuff, deal with the primary source material, okay? Um, don't just make offhanded claims. Anyway, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day.